Deep in the heart of South Florida lies the Everglades, a vast region of interconnected rivers, bays, and ocean, lined with mangroves, grass prairies, and sandy beaches. Everglades National Park, which encompasses most of this region, offers the paddler a true wilderness experience through the wilderness waterway. The best part about this journey is there's absolutely no portages. Designated a World Heritage Site and an International Biosphere Reserve, the Everglades National Park, located in southwest Florida, is home to the Wilderness Waterway Trail. The 160 kilometer route located between the towns of Everglades City and Flamingo can be paddled in about eight or nine days. But with only six days available, we settled on a loop that would allow us three days inland and three days along the coast in the ocean waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Making your way along the waterway trail is pretty straightforward, assuming you have a good map with you. And navigating all the twists and turns is made a bit easier by the addition of more than a hundred numbered channel markers to help guide you on your journey. Setting up camp for the night can only be done at designated areas, which must be pre-booked at the ranger station before heading out. In the Everglades, you'll find there are three distinct kinds of campsites available. The first is a ground site, which as the name implies means of course your tent is set up on solid ground. Your second choice is called a chicky, which is basically an elevated deck built out over the water. And your third choice for camping in the Everglades is pitching your tent on a gorgeous beach site. Ground sites tend to be located where old pioneering homesteads once stood. The buildings are long gone, and the only reminders that people once lived here are the crumbling foundation walls that still remain. These sites are equipped with picnic tables and an outhouse. No campfires are permitted on any of the ground sites. There really is not much solid ground in the Everglades. From a distance, the green foliage would suggest otherwise, but upon closer inspection, you soon realize that the waterline here consists mostly of mangrove roots and mud. And so, the park has built these structures called chickies, which give campers a stable, elevated platform on which to pitch a tent. Just make sure you have a tent that does not require pegs. And because these decks are made of wood, there are no fires allowed here either. Situated out over the water, they often catch the breeze, and as such, can be less buggy than some of the ground sites. They also serve as a great fishing platform. The beach sites are located on the ocean side of the Everglades, in the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. These truly are primitive sites, since they have no picnic tables or outhouses. But the trade-off here is you are allowed to have an open fire on the beach. The first three days of our journey took us down the inland passage where calm waters meant easy paddling. From large open bays to tiny overgrown creeks, We made our way south, sometimes exploring side routes that ended up being more jungle than water. Along the way we had plenty of opportunities to view the local wildlife, especially the numerous birds that call this area home. We also saw manatees and several dolphins. And of course, 
a trip to the Everglades just would not be complete without seeing an alligator or two. Most often we'd just spot them hanging around on the shoreline sunning themselves. But occasionally, one would join us in the water and swim alongside our canoe. Our evenings were spent fishing the quiet Everglades backwaters, where we caught mostly small mullets, but we also hooked into a sea trout and a good-sized catfish that put up a strong fight. After three days of sheltered paddling, it was time to head north. This meant venturing out into the open waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Now one of the most rewarding experiences when canoeing in the Florida Everglades is camping on one of these islands out in the ocean for the night. These little keys have beautiful white sandy beaches, they're covered in mangroves, some have palm trees, but it really is a tropical paradise. Well, out here in the Everglades, you're constantly in the salt water. Even in those inland rivers and bays, sometimes it's hard to realize that you're canoeing on salt water until you actually get out here with the archipelago of islands. So that's one thing you're going to have to consider. You're going to have to bring lots of fresh water. On this trip alone for five days, we brought 13 gallons of water with us. And that's enough. We seem to have about oh, five more gallons of water, and this is our last day out here. But that's one thing you're not going to want to run out of because when you do, you can't drink the salt water at all. Small craft advisory in effect from 10 p.m. this evening through Sunday morning. Tonight, east northeast winds 17 to 22 knots. Seas 2 feet near shore and up to 2 to 4 feet offshore. Now, in planning your trip here, you're going to want to factor in the tides. Uh, going up and down those rivers, depending on what tide's coming in, high tide or low tide, you'll either have a river current going with you or going against you. Now, usually it's not too strong. Uh, it's like a small river current, so you're generally able to paddle up through most of it. But landing on some of these beach sites can be difficult. For instance, 
When we got to this beach site yesterday, it was high tide, and the water was just a meter or two down from where the canoe is now. But when we woke up today, as you can see, it's now low tide, and the water is way out there. And so, as we prepared to head out on our last day in the Florida Everglades, it seemed a small portage lay before us. We had to carry the canoe and all our gear at least half a kilometer along this now exposed sandbar before eventually finding a place with enough water depth to allow us to launch our boat and head back to port.